Hello everyone, welcome to Optional is Not a Failure. Possibly one of my most overloaded, overloaded titles yet. I think you can read at least three meanings into this, possibly four, depending on how you think about it. Um, I'm Phil Nash. Um, many of you may know me as uh, the author of Catch, uh, and of course a regular speaker at conferences. But I'm also developer advocate at JetBrains, so I should really mention that at the start. Uh, so we have a number of C++ tools, mostly uh, C Lion and ReSharp for C++. Won't be talking about that in this talk, so if you want to hear more about it, come and speak to me afterwards. Uh, we're going to be talking about this subject, and I hope it's not going to be a big surprise to hear that it's going to be about error handling. Um, anyone know what these pictures from? I know we had one guess earlier. Apollo 13 mission, yeah. So uh, flight director Gene Kranz here. Um, actually, his autobiography uh, had the title, uh, Failure is not an option which uh, he never actually said during the mission, but it was uh, made famous by the, uh, the film, um, which I watched um, just recently as part of my uh, research for this talk. Uh, <laughs> so it's a great film, you should go and watch it. Um, he, he says that during the, uh, the oxygen tank um, emergency. Uh, and if you think about it, that's also a good metaphor for uh, some of our error handling uh, situations. You know, literally failure is not an option, um, it's something that we, we can't allow. Uh, in other cases, um, errors are things that we, we can allow. Uh, we might need to make a distinction between, between those cases, but we'll come on to that. So I've waffled enough as uh, people are walking in, so I'm going to get started on the, the real meat of it, while people find a seat. I want to start going right back to the fundamentals, really get to the essence, like the, the, the Zen property of, of what is an error. Um, and it uh, might be worth starting from more of a, a user's perspective uh, of what an error might be. Uh, the average user will probably think of some bug that becomes visible while they're using your application. Uh, there's plenty of these things you can find on the internet. I saw this one on Twitter last week and I thought it was brilliant just to uh, zoom in and look at the, the beauty of that error message presented to, to the user. Singleton Bing creation not allowed. Um, I mean, even if you know what this stuff means, that, that's just amazing. <laughs> now, the, the, the person that found and tweeted this, I, I don't know if they really understood much about it um, and whether what they said about it was a bit tongue-in-cheek, but I thought it was, it was really good. I'll let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> now, crafting good error messages is a bit out of scope for this talk. Um, we might sort of touch on... Um, converting errors at boundaries a bit later, but really this is just to get us warmed up a bit. Not all errors or, or failures are things that are going to be obvious to an end user. Um, oh, <laughs> there's, there's a bit of an error already. <laughs> that seems to be the projector, I think. There we go. Okay. Um, a, lot, a lot of bugs are not observable, and sometimes it feels like we've actually got away with it. If, if the bug's not visible, is it really there? But actually, we know from hard experience that these are some of the nastiest types of bugs we can deal with because um, they can go unnoticed for a long time. Uh, they'll probably occur you know, when we least expect it in the hands of our users, um, possibly silently corrupting data and other things as, as they go. So th these are often the, the worst types of bugs. So really, we want to treat all of these seriously, whether they're immediately visible or not. Um, but not all bugs are uh, very serious. And a lot of people have toyed with different um, names that we might give uh, errors in our code uh, to maybe like take the edge off that a bit. Um, one that's uh, been going around a lot the last few years, probably seen, disappointments. And I really like that. You know, it's, I didn't really want this to happen. It's a bit disappointing. <laughs> that, that, that's sort of take the edge off it. But also scales. You can have a minor disappointments, but it can scale right up to you know, really big disappointments. <laughs> But that's what happens uh, you know, when the error occurs. Uh, and then what you do next, uh, we have terminology for that as well. Uh, so very common term uh, that the happy path is what we take when, when no error occurs. Uh, and I'm going to use that because it's, it's familiar and it's, it's quite descriptive. But what's the opposite of the happy path? And I, I did some searching on this. There doesn't seem to really be a consensus. If you ask people directly, people will often say, oh, the sad path, because you know, it seems like the opposite. But Actually, it's not really that good a term, and most people don't use it in practice. Um, actually, I, uh, I tracked down a tweet by uh, Ron Jeffries, uh, where he asked the same question, what's the opposite of the happy path? And uh, he didn't really get uh, a very consistent response either. 
Uh, he, he suggested a few of his own. Uh, my favourite one was the Veil of Tears, <laughs> but um, that's not very useful either. Um, so let's say sad path, not not particularly useful. Oh, there's the the tweet from Ron Jeffries. Um, so th there's a lot of uh, responses to that. Um, maybe in keeping with the the disappointments, we we might go for the grumpy path. <laughs> but that's not that useful either. So I'm going to use the error path simply because that keeps with a choice of um, talking about errors. So an error is not necessarily um, a bug or a failure. It's just, as we said, a disappointment. It's something we didn't really want to happen, but we probably have to deal with it anyway. But it may be, it may be a failure as well. So different types of errors um, <laughs> may or may not be presented to the user. Uh, we can break these down into different types and categorize them a bit. An old favourite that uh, I'm sure we've seen. I'm sure we've seen this. We may have even written it. I know I have. Uh, I'm sure our users have seen it too. Um, presented in a dialogue or in a, or in a log or something. Um, so yeah, it shouldn't happen, but it does. Um, in fact, in a really sort of beautiful irony, while I was preparing these slides, Keynote actually crashed on this slide and gave me this, uh, <laughs> this stack down. <laughs> Bad access. I really like the uh, Exceed Corpse Notify. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I restarted it and it was fine. So, yeah, some things should never happen. Um, that, that's the first category of things. We have a couple of other categories as well that we, we can get into. Um, well, I'll just put some, some examples along with these. So, you know, things that should never happen. You know, null dereference, out of range access, uh, use after free. Probably one of those sort of things that happened when, when Keynote crashed. Um, you know, they, they really shouldn't happen. But there are things that shouldn't usually happen, um, you know, to the point that we often don't expect them at all. Maybe we don't code for them, um, but probably we should. Um, so you know, the canonical example is out of heap memory. And obviously, that depends on your environment. Got, got Odin here. I'm sure has to deal with this all the time. I don't use people it. in more. I don't deal with this. Okay. All right, <laughs> oh, you get a free pass. But a lot of people in very constrained environments have to deal with this a lot. But those of us working on, on desktops and, and servers. Uh, often we've got used to the fact that this never happens um, in practice, but actually we technically should still handle it. But most of the uh, errors that we deal with fall into the last category. Well, you know, they might happen, and if they do, we're going to be a bit disappointed because, you know, we prefer it if they didn't. So we still have a happy path that we want to follow, but we also have to weigh that up with the, uh, the error path as well and, and, you know, treat them both um, almost equally. So. Some examples there. Um, well, I'll put these examples. File not found, can't convert from string, <laughs> can't find a key in a map. Sorry if they're a bit hard to see at the back. Um, and you might be thinking, well, actually, I, I might categorize these in one of the other slots. And a few of these can float around. In fact, one of the observations is that what type of category these errors come into is often a property of the call site rather than the implementation. And yet we often have to choose a strategy for how to handle it in the implementation. So that can be a problem sometimes. We might look at some ways to, to deal with that. We can also break them down a little bit differently. So the should never happen errors are generally not recoverable. There might be some, uh, some exceptions to that. There might be some ways that we can recover from them, but typically they're not recoverable. Uh, because you know what, what can you do when this happens? It's not something that should happen. The, the rest, of course, then must be recoverable. Whether you can actually recover from them, again, you know, it depends on the actual um, case that we're dealing with. Um, you see, I've also broken them down by whether they're logic errors or the result of IO or side effects. And really, if you think about it, it's the only breakdown that makes sense because either the errors occur with, from something within the code or from outside the code. So logic errors or IO, that's the only, only way these things can happen. And you can see, you know, because some of these things may actually represent logic errors uh, sometimes, other times they may be the result of, of side effects. So, yeah, we, we need a way to deal with, deal with these things differently at different times. Okay, that's uh, the really high level stuff. Before we really get into some code, I want to do a bit of maths. Now, you might be thinking monads. We will talk about monads a little bit later. That's not what I'm going to talk about now. Do some different maths. So, there's a mathematical notation for a function. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this. 
f of x uh, yields a y or returns a y, depending on how you want to say it. Um, now, in this notation, there's only one argument, one return value. Um, even in math, you can have multiple arguments. Um, but we can also model them as a single argument with something like a, a tuple, for example. So even same with the return value. We can have multiple return values. And um, there's actually a name for these types of types. In general, we call them product types. That's a mathematical term. I'm sure you've, you've heard that term. And the reason we call them product types is because we're dealing with the, the range of possible values of these types. So the range of possible values of that uh, input uh, argument is the product of the ranges of all of its members. That's, that's all it is to it. That's, that's where the term comes from. Same with the return value there. Now, if we uh, look at it from the perspective of the function itself, the, the range of all the inputs to a function we call the domain of the function, and the range of all of the possible return values we call the codomain. And we can think of this as just a, uh, a mapping of points between these domains. And this is assuming that this is a pure function. Um, actually, we can, we can model this pretty closely most of the time. So uh, even if it's a, uh, a member variable, we can consider this to be an argument. Um, even globals, we consider to be implicit arguments. Um, if you really want to push it, you can actually get side effects in there as well. Uh, we, we don't necessarily need to, to do that. But let's just keep it simple. Think about pure functions for now. So any given point in the domain should map to a point in the codomain. Not necessarily one to one, it could be one to many, many to one. Uh, in this example, where we're taking in a string and returning in some sort of conversion, it's, it's obvious that there are going to be points in the domain that don't have a mapping in the codomain. So what, what do we do with those? Uh, that's, that's one of these uh, error uh, modes that we're going to have to think about. Now, in, in maths terms, well, when we go to that in code, that we might assert there, or just, just call standard abort, which is what assert will do anyway, um, at least in a debug build. In mathematical terms, we call this a partial function, because only part of the code domain is actually mapped from the domain. If, uh, if you're going to throw an exception, well, depending on how you look at it, maybe that's a partial function, maybe it's not. We'll, we'll come back to that a bit later. Uh, but we can make this a total function by providing a, a mapping on, in the, uh, the code domain. Uh, so one, one way of doing that would be to use standard optional. Now we have that. So now we, we wrap all of our uh, valid values in an optional, and the invalid values just map to, to an empty. Straightforward. I'm sure we've done this. Um, that means now that every point in the domain has a mapping to the code domain, and hence it's a total function. Uh, in math terms, total functions are always preferred, if we can. And that's can be true in, in code as well, depending on how you look at it. But there are definitely cases where trying to force something into a, to, to be a total function uh, can actually make things worse. So we'll, we'll look at that in a little while. But uh, just thinking about this for a moment, by using optional here to make this into a total function, there are now no failure modes. So that's the first interpretation of our title. Optional is not a failure. Makes sense if you think about it. Um, which, which means we're not treating it as an error as such, <laughs> although we may actually do that in our code, but it's up to the call site to, to say how to respond to that. There's other ways that we can make this sort of thing into a, a total function. Um, this particular example, converting a string is not a great example. Very often it's ranges of integers that cause the problem. Uh, integers have the often huge ranges and we only actually write our functions to um, to interpret very narrow ranges. So in Ada, for example, that's actually part of the language that you define your integral types in terms of their ranges, their valid ranges. So here's an example from, uh, from Wikipedia uh, for a date class. And you can see the, uh, the day type, month type, year type. They're all defined in terms of ranges. <coughs> so you actually can't pass invalid values into that. Now, if you think about it for a moment, that's still not going to catch all the possible errors. So we'll We'll look at that in a moment. In fact, um, we'll, we'll come onto that in just a moment. Obviously, this, this sort of uh, mechanism is not built into C++. We can uh, achieve something like this using libraries. Um, there's a, the bounded integers library by uh, David Stone, 
which I've not used personally, but from, from what I've heard, that, that should give us a, a good approximation of this, uh, can definitely be worth considering, because that then removes the possibility of having to deal with errors in the functions that we're passing these integers to a lot of the time. So let's, um, let's have a look at this data example in C++. Start with the simplest possible thing, just a struct with, uh, with a few integers, so that there's no balance checking on this, there's, there's no checking at all. Then we can construct one of these, maybe like this, nice valid date, no problem at all. And of course, because there's no checking, we can construct an invalid date and nothing happens until you know, later we come to use it and then something else will blow up. So we don't want that, so maybe we'll add a constructor, make our members private, and we'll do some sort of uh, validation here. Um, and actually, there's another step that we can do now, now that we're trying to encapsulate what goes on here a bit. Maybe we should make those members um, const so that once that data is constructed, the only way that we can change it is by creating another valid date. And that way we don't have to um, allow for this date to exist in an invalid state. So how are we going to validate it? Well, one way we could do that is with asserts, for example. So here we're just uh, testing the, the range of the, the month and day values. Um, and that's enough to catch the example that we, that we just gave. So now that uh, will assert at runtime in a debug build and give us some information about what happened. So, that, so that's quite nice. But the reason we're using asserts here is because we, we expect never to actually um, hit this uh, if we've done everything else right. So th this is to catch those logic errors that we talked about. The, this should never happen cases. Um, but that can be a bit dangerous as well because, you know, we may be getting these integers from I.O., for example. Um, we're going to have to do some checking somewhere, and it would be nice if that was part of the interface of this. So, oh, the, uh, the other thing we, we haven't caught, of course, is the dependency between which particular month it is and then the, the value range of dates. So, the 31st of February, <laughs> we need to add another assert for. There's a few more asserts you really need to, to add to get this um, catching everything. But um, what we're really talking about here are contracts. So all we have so far in C++ are asserts, but there is a proposal to add uh, fully fledged cont contracts to C++. Uh, seems to be going quite well, not without its critics. So you know, now is still is the time to, to jump in and see whether you think this is going to, uh, to cover everything. But this gives us more fine-grained assertions, so preconditions, postconditions, invariants, assertions, um, encoded as attributes. So there's something that the compiler is more aware of. And uh, also visible, these preconditions visible outside of the function. One of the prop problems with asserts is they're part of the implementation. Contracts are on the interface. And that should give you more control over what happens uh, in the event of uh, catching a failure. So as well as aborting, they can also uh, call a handler or uh, like with asserts, you can have a mode where they, they just do nothing, open you up to undefined behavior. Um, one of the criticisms is uh, some people would like more fine-grained control still, so that you, you decide that on a case-by-case -case basis. But um, so definitely worth looking at the, um, the proposal. <coughs> now I mentioned un undefined behavior because undefined behavior is not always a bad thing. Um, if you never expect to actually trigger it, then that can open the compiler up to uh, optimization opportunities um, and certainly you know, remove a lot of checking. There's, uh, there's quite a lot of material on, on that. Loads of talks, including um, uh, John Regger's uh, two talks, actually, from uh, CppCon last year. Um, there's a few others. Chandler did one. Um, I've got loads of references to these at the end if you're interested. Uh, it's definitely worth being familiar with, with undefined behavior. OK, before we move on, I'm going to move into the next section. And uh, I want to start with uh, some quotes. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with this one. Death of Angst yet Spur is a Nordic Gelder from Tiden. Now we know what that means, don't we? Actually, anyone speak Danish here? Okay, did I get that even close to right? No, okay. Death of Angst is a Nordic Gelder from Tiden. In English, it's translated, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Now we, we are familiar with that one, I'm sure, but the reason I put the Danish up there is because it's been attributed to a lot of people. Um, most of that's almost certainly false, but 
One of the attributions is uh, Niels Bohr. He may have said it, don't know, but it's almost certainly a, a Danish proverb uh, at some point. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk a bit about the future of C++ error handling. And, yeah, we, we can't ac accurately make predictions, but... We're also going to talk about the history C++ error handling, because if not, we're, we're doomed to, to repeat it anyway. Um, one more quote. This is from me now <laughs> saying this. Those who don't know the present state of things don't know where they are. Well, yeah, we, we, should, we should see where we are before we decide to move forward, I think. All right, so what we're going to do is look at, and obviously we covered the sort of the, the, the contract side, I glossed over it a bit, uh, the, the cases where things should really never happen. So now we're going to be talking about things that we, we do need to deal with and be able to recover from. Um, and what I want to do is go through sort of a historical or chronological uh, coverage, not strictly speaking, but um, as we go through, I want to keep a scorecard so that we can compare these all. And this is a little bit of a dangerous thing for me to do with this audience, because I'm sure everyone's going to disagree with almost everything I say. Um, these are subjective values that I, I've put in, just to give an indication of the relative weightings of things. And I'm sure we'll quibble over the details. Hopefully, we'll, we'll mostly be on the same page in the broad strokes. So yeah, if you've got a little quibble, save that till the end. If you think I'm completely wrong about something, then do interrupt me. So I'm going to keep track of the overhead, <coughs> both on the happy path and the error path separately. Um, but when I say overhead, I mostly mean performance, but also you know, space as well. And we're going to score from 1 to 10, where 1 is bad, 10 is good. So actually, 10 is low overhead, a little bit confusing. Sorry about that. Uh, safety, uh, how, how easy it is to do the right thing, how hard to do the wrong thing, and vice versa. So again, you know, 10 means it's very safe, 1 not safe at all. Noise, again, this one is sort of a little bit reversed. Um, high score means low noise in the code. Um, low score means it's, it's very succinct and, and expressive. <coughs> uh, separate paths, and I, what I mean by that is if you've got uh, your, your happy path up here, you can have like, multiple steps and then push the error handling off to the side, as we're familiar with, with traditional exceptions. Reasonability, hopefully it will become clearer what I mean by that as we go through, but just simply the, the ability to reason about the, the error handling in the code, uh, whether a function uh, will yield errors or not and what you have to do with them. And composability, how easy it is to compose these functions together, uh, either compose the functionality itself or compose the error handling or both. And finally, uh, message, that means whether we can convey extra information about the error that can be useful for reporting, for error dialogues, logging, whatever, or, or even responding to on different paths. So. I'm sure there are other ways we can categorize these things, but since usually when we talk about these things, we have like one or two things in mind, I think this is already quite a good separation of metrics. All right, so starting with error codes. So although I'm sort of going through chronologically, we're going to use some modern types here, down a string, bool, uh, that's fine. It's, it's the, uh, the approach to error handling that, that is sort of the older style that's of course still in, in common use. The example I'm using here, function to create a directory. So it takes a string, directory name presumably, and returns a ball, which doesn't explicitly say, state that that's an error status, but you can sort of infer it. It's um, idiomatic. So we would expect that to be true if it created it in false otherwise. OK. Um, usage code, pretty straightforward. Uh, no surprises, I think. Just a, a manual if statement. The, the if case is the happy path, the else case is the error path, nothing else to it. Simple. How does it score? Oh, actually, one other thing to point out, that the fact that we do return a ball, although it doesn't actually say it's an error, still makes this a marked propagation of, of errors. So we can actually see in the code that an error can come at this point. And we have no discard. Sorry? And we have no discard now. And we'll come to that, come to that. So how does this score? Again, like I say, these, these are my scores. You may score them slightly differently. I'll try and explain how I've arrived at these scores. So the overhead on the happy and error path is, is pretty good. It's a uh, pretty low overhead. Not, not perfect score, but 9 out of 10 for both of those. 
Safety though is, is really not so good. It's, it's very easy to, um, as written here, it's very easy to forget to deal with the, the error code. Um, th there's nothing that forces you there. Um, it's quite noisy. You've got to do a manual if statement. And if you've got many of these things in sequence, most of the code becomes error handling code. So it's quite noisy. No separation of paths, that's closely related. Um, but reasonability, not bad. Again, because it's marked propagation, you know, when you look at the function signature, you, you've got a good idea that this can return an error um, and what you need to do about it. See you do look. Composability is not great because you've got to deal with the error code manually. Uh, and it doesn't convey any extra information about the type of error. So what about no discard? OK, we have that now. If we put the no discard attribute on there, then um, the compiler will at least warn us if we, uh, if we don't deal with it. So that does improve our safety score. Um, so I'll say it's not perfect, partly because um, it, it's, it's really a workaround for, uh, for this approach. And it's not required to even give the, the diagnostic, I believe. So it's better, definitely better. And if we're doing this sort of thing, definitely use no discard if you can. All right, the next type is to have an integer return. Uh, that might be an enum as well. Um, as far as this is concerned, it's much the same. Otherwise, pretty much the same as the Boolean case. Um, for some reason, I put the noise down a bit. I can't remember why. Uh, oh, yeah, because now we have to have the separate um, capturing of the result and then testing it on, on a separate line, so it's slightly noisier. Um, otherwise, it's the same, except now the message score goes up. We've got a, a channel to indicate what type of error it was over and above what the error was itself. Um, the, the reason I chose this example of create directory, and some of you may have already been thinking this, is what about the case where the directory already exists? So it's not going to create the directory, and it's probably going to report that, but it's not actually an error, as in you still want to take the happy path. So now we have this finer grained uh, result code, we can, we can handle that. We can test for that as well. A little bit noisier maybe, but, but we can do that. So I disagree with the mark now, because that could, be, could have been the file descriptor. Um, yes, it could have been. So yeah, maybe that's another reason maybe the, the safety should go down a bit. Um, we haven't got perfect scores there. But there's still, still room for interpretation. You may still have to consult the documentation. Maybe changing it to an enum rather than just a raw int would be better, but traditionally it's been a raw int. A variant on that is where you pass the int as an argument instead. Uh, and in this example, we've got to avoid return, but if you did actually want to return something, then this opens up that possibility as well. So this is a fairly common style. Of course, you can also do that the other way around. You can pass the return value as, a, as an out parameter. Other than that, it, it reads much the same. Um, but I'd say safety goes down because now it's, it's even harder to, uh, to think about that being where your errors are going to come from when they're actually an argument rather than the return value. Uh, for the same reason, reasonability goes down. And composability, because now you've got to thread this, um, this extra variable through an argument. Um, otherwise, not that different. Another variant on that is where we, we do the argument um, for the fine-grained result, but we also have the Boolean return just to say broadly, did it fail or not? That actually improves some things ironically, because it's now easier to say what the um, Boolean return, we just need to do an if statement on that. We only need to look at the result in the failure case, which still helps us with our already exist case. So yeah, safety goes up a little bit, back to where it was actually. It's also slightly easier to reason about, again, for the same reason. So this is a fairly common um, sort of traditional error handling approach. And then we have the case where you're actually setting some sort of global or thread local um, <coughs> variable. That means that the, the function signature is completely unmarked. There's nothing here to indicate that there might be an error coming out of it. So for that reason, most of these scores go down. Um, 
Actually, I put the overhead down, as in a higher overhead, because you know, modern architectures, we're probably going to have to make that thread local. So that's going to be slightly more expensive than checking just the return value. Uh, Safety is way down because it's so easy to, to not know about the error. Um, Reasonability is down for the same reason. Uh, composability, ironic though, is up. It's going to be easier to compose this because the error handling is not getting in the way. That's the one advantage. Okay, but generally not good. I think we'll agree. So again, we can mix that with a Boolean return. This is something we still see commonly, uh, particularly in systems code. Um, Boolean return tell us that there was an error. And if you want to know what the error was, you consult this global variable. So yeah, safety is up again. Reasonability is up again. Um, composability, uh, I think that's a mistake. That should be down. Not sure what I was thinking there. Um, so quite a, quite a bit of variation just when dealing with error codes, I think. Um, we really have to weigh up what it is we want to optimize for. Safety, reasonability, performance. Um, nothing's clearly perfect. So, yeah, you're looking. Okay, I thought you'd, right. Okay, so what about exceptions? We're coming more into you know, where we are now with uh, you know, traditional standard C++. It's not to say everyone's using these. Let's look at the same example. So, first thing to note is unmarked. I know it's not always true. Um, obviously, we have no accept. That may help, but it's optional. So if it doesn't say no accept, we can't rely on it always throwing an exception. A lot of code doesn't have no accept, and therefore we just have to assume it froze. So not great. But let's have a look at the scores. The overhead, very interesting. So on the happy path, like giving it a perfect 10, you may want to quiver with that. There is some overhead. Um, I'd say it's minimal compared to the others. Um, we can argue the details, maybe make it a 9. It's pretty good though. But the error path, I've got a one. And that probably doesn't do it justice. Um, <laughs> maybe point one would be, would be better. We'll, uh, we'll have a look at the figures there uh, in, in a while. But that, that's for most people that want to avoid exceptions, um, either everywhere or in certain parts of the code. You know, that, that's really the killer. Um, although you know, the unmarked nature is pretty bad as well. Safety is OK, not great. Um, noise is, is better. It's not as noisy because um, you know, we have dedicated error handling channel now. We've got that separation of the, the error handling path, so that's up. Um, reasonability, well, it's, um, you know, we know about exceptions, they're idiomatic, but it's not marked, so it's, it's difficult to reason about whether there's an exception there unless it says no accept. Um, but composability is great because, again, we separated the error handling out so we can compose functions together nicely. And we can have sequences of calls in here which all may throw exceptions. All well, that's handled for you. That's nice. Perfect score for message because we can put any object we like as the exception type. So really a mixed bag. Uh, there's definitely no clear winner overall between exceptions and error codes. So we need to go somewhere else if we want to do better. Uh, before we move off exceptions, though, here's another problem. What about that case where the directory already exists? Does that throw an exception? In which case, we've got to do something like this, where we catch the already exist case. We've now got bifurcation of the happy path, it's, and we're going to pay the performance penalty. It's not ideal. Or maybe we mix it with return codes. Um, yeah, no, no approach is ideal there. Create dear should throw on the already exists. Ensure exists should not. <coughs> and you just have to. Um, OK, so the, the comment was that um, you, you probably wouldn't see this sort of thing in practice because you would, you would give that a se separate function like ensure exists. Uh, that's true. That's one way of dealing with it in this particular case. Um, and yeah, to be fair, this sort of case doesn't come up a lot, um, but it may still come up. So. It's one slight weakness with it's exceptions weird. as they are. Too happy path is my point. It's just yeah. weird. 
yeah, I, well, I agree. I agree that it's weird um, and that there's usually other ways to deal with it, but you have to think about them. So, but fair point, yeah. Okay. Uh, who here came to um, uh, Michael Spencer's talk just now? You can see I updated my slides already. Um, <laughs> so it has covered exceptions at length in terms of what's actually going on behind the scenes and the, uh, the performance. Um, if you didn't see it, you should catch the video when it comes out. Um, but another talk on exceptions from Meeting C++ was uh, Niall Douglas's talk actually on um, proposed standard accepted, uh, expected. But he talks about the cost of exceptions there. One of the points that Michael made actually was that um, you know, sometimes the cost of exceptions isn't as bad as we've been making out. Uh, Niall's going in the opposite direction. And there's a number of people that have been making metrics about the cost of exceptions, all telling very different stories. Most of them are more this sort of this end where exceptions are extremely expensive. So I don't know if you can read that there, but the, the yellow bars are the, the, uh, the exception calling cost. This is down 10 stack frames, so it's not just, just one stack frame. The, uh, the total CPU cycles axis is logarithmic, or uh, exponential rather, so it's going up in orders of magnitude. So typically, two orders of magnitude uh, overhead for the, um, for the error path, with exceptions. Now I know that uh, uh, Michael gave some different figures on that, um, but I think his one was 48 times, it's still pretty bad. Uh, yeah. yeah. All, all of my, basically all of my talk was about the happy path uh, before his slides. I, I didn't, I think I mentioned once, the, the, that was the 48 of the, the uh, bad path. Yeah, so, so, so. I'm not surprised by your numbers. So, so the comment from, Comment from Michael was most of his figures were about the happy path. Um, he only mentioned once the, uh, the the error path. Of course, that's the one I, I picked up on. Um, but you also made the point that even on the happy path, you, you saw a 10% overhead because of the um, not allowing for vectorization. So my perfect 10 figure for exceptions certainly doesn't always hold. You make it in the way of optimization. So that was a good point that I hadn't incorporated here. So definitely there's a problem though. I think everyone agrees there's a problem with the performance of exceptions if the, uh, the error path is going to be triggered more than truly exceptionally cases. And actually, even if, even if not, there can be an un un unacceptable overhead. To that point, a um, paper that Herb Sutter has written, which um, I'm going to talk about more later, but I just want to quote this bit for now, because based on the... Um, 2018 C++ Foundation Developer Survey uh, says that many projects ban exceptions. And I think this is the figure that uh, Michael was, was hoping to get from the room. 52% of C++ developers in the survey reported that exceptions were banned in part or all of their project code. So not all, all of them all of the time, but more than half of C++ developers surveyed um, have exceptions banned at least some of the time. That's a, you know, I think that surprised everyone, pretty much. Um, goes on to say, most are not allowed to freely use C++'s primary recommended error handling model that is required to use a standard language and library. But it goes on to say that you know, half, half of these projects are not using the standard library um, or they're using a, uh, a non-standard version of it for this reason. So. This is, this is pretty serious, it's a pretty serious problem with C++ C++ standard as it's currently defined. So we need to do something about that. We're going to come back to this a bit later. But first, some more maths. So this is where we got to earlier. Uh, we were talking about um, product types. Um, and we also talked about returning an optional, but an optional is what we call a sum type. And for the same reason that product type is talking about the product of the range of the input values. A sum type is the sum of possible um, ranges of values. So an optional only has the, the, the two cases, uh, empty or in this case int. So that's pretty simple, but we have other sum types. In fact, already in the language, either currently or, or proposed, as well as optional, we have variant, uh, expected is proposed. We've got boost outcome. Many of us have rolled our own versions of something similar. Um, these are all examples of sum types. 
um, a type that allows us to represent the choice of possible types. Uh, so when you hear people talking about uh, ADTs for error handling, they're talking about arithmetic data types and specifically some types. So just in case you weren't familiar with that terminology, that's all we're talking about. Again, product types. Um, there's a few examples of those in the language, but not a big concern for us here. Let's go back to the, the date example, because earlier we were talking about contracts more. We got as far as assertions. Uh, we, we talked about the contract's proposal. But you may want this date class to be used in a, in a more speculative way, where we may somehow end up giving it um, unvalidated inputs. Uh, we want to do that validation somewhere. It'd be nice to do it somewhere close to the date class, where it knows what its um, constraints are. So one way we could do that, I'm going to skip ahead there and go back. Keynote playing up again, at least it's not crashing. There we go. So one way we could do that, not everyone's preferred way, uh, this is what I typically do, um, make the constructor private, because um, we don't want people just uh, easily invoking undefined behavior. Uh, so you have a static method that will do the checking at runtime, and only if it passes that, then create the, the raw date class. So this is going to return an optional here, an optional date. So it's marked propagation. And if it's not a valid date, it just returns uh, an empty optional. <laughs> Straightforward enough. Uh, some variations. Oh, there's the usage, by the way. Um, so you could do that in a manual if statement. Dereference as if it's a pointer. And in the, in the, the, uh, the error path, obviously we don't have any more information other than that it wasn't uh, validated. Uh, some variations. Uh, we may want to expose the uh, the, the version with undefined behavior. Um, my preference is to make that really obvious if you're doing that. So yeah, there, there are times when you need it. Um, make it grappable, uh, make it obvious, <laughs> and make it harder to type. So that's not the default thing you'll reach for. Uh, other people have different opinions, and that's fine. Um, if you've done that, you may want to just um, remove that constructor and do it all in the, the unchecked version, but that's uh, not that relevant. Um, but let's look at the score for using optional for our error handling. Overhead, pretty good. Slight overhead over the error codes, but still, still up there, even for the error path. Um, safety is better now. Not a perfect score, but we're now forced to take account of the fact that we're dealing with an optional. It's right in our face. Uh, we could dereference it without checking it, but you know, you, you sort of get what you, you deserve in that case. So not a perfect score, but it's pretty good. But it's still quite noisy. We've still got the manual list statement. We now have to also dereference the, uh, the value to, to get it out. Um, we still don't have separate paths for the error handling. Um, but reasonability, it's about as good as it gets. Because we can see in there that it's, uh, it's optional. Uh, we've got a pretty good idea that either we're going to get the value or not. It's encoded in the type. Um, and we have to deal with it, checked by the compiler. Um, composability. I give it a halfway score because you can compose the error types, uh, sorry, the error values, but not necessarily the, the values you wanted. But we'll look at some techniques for improving that. Uh, in this case, it's either valid or not, so message is, is pretty low. All right, see what we can do to improve that. So I said there are other sum types. Next one we might want to reach for in the current standard is variant. So now we can create a, a choice of types. So in this case, we've got a date or a, a string to convey an error message. Um, you probably wouldn't do that in practice. You'd have some sort of dedicated error type, maybe an error code. Um, but it's useful for the sake of exposition. So now we can actually be more fine-grained about what type of error occurred. Was it a problem with the month or the day or something more complex? So we can see those there. Um, in the usage, we've got to do a little bit more work to get that value out. This is not really optimized for error handling. We've got to use this uh, holds alternative to, to see whether it was actually a date. If it was, we've got to use standard get to get it out. 
and also with the, the error case. Uh, yeah, and that. You could use the uh, variant of std get where you take the address and then you get an option and you get the date that you already have the date star in the happy path. And then you can check it. So look, much like you did in the previous example where you used auto a, you, and then check the, the, the return and then had the object available. I wonder if that would help. Um, Is that clear enough? Or? I'm not quite sure what you said at the beginning. So say that again, sorry. So there is a variant of get where you can say, mm -hmm. I might not get this by passing the address. Oh, right. Okay. So could, could we use a variant of standard get that's more speculative so we could try to get the, the, the date out and if, if not fail, back to the happy path. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, did, I missed that. That, that, would, that would improve things a bit. I agree. Um, it's still more of a boast, but that, that would be better. I agree. <laughs> All right, let's have a look at the score. We'll, we'll try and account for that. Overhead about the same as optional, maybe. Um, safety is, is down a bit because it's, it's just a little bit harder to, to do all of this. That's the only reason I've marked that down. Um, it's definitely noisier. I've put a one here. Maybe we could increase that a bit with, with Matt's suggestion. Um, but at least we've got a perfect score for the message. Like with exceptions, we could put anything we want for the, for the error type. Um, so that's as good as it gets. So overall, that's an improvement, um, especially if we, um, we use Matt's suggestion for the standard gap. But it's still, still not great. So moving forwards, proposed standard expected gives us just a slightly more optimized version of that same concept. Um, so again, we can specify the two types. Uh, again, standard string, not the best choice, but it's uh, simpler to talk about. Um, but now it looks a lot more like the, uh, the optional case, uh, except that in the, the error path, we can just access the error. So uh, there's some other differences as well, but for our purposes, that's, that's pretty much it. It's just nicer to use. Uh, so again, overhead about the same. Safety is now improved because it's easier to work with. Um, noise is better, but still, still not great. The rest is the same. So starting to edge towards something a bit better, but still some pretty low numbers in here. We're still not really you know, at, at where we want to be. So what can we do about this? To um, go on to the next example, because I want to bring out the, um, the composability side a bit more. So far, we've only been dealing with a single function. Uh, to, to be able to compose functions, you need more than one function to compose. So I've um, got a couple here. Um, Something like our string conversion to int, takes a string, returns an expected of int or error type, and divide just as an integer divide, but we are trapping the um, divide by zero case. Um, you probably wouldn't write that in practice, but it's for the sake of the example. So we, we want to be able to compose these things together. So here's how you would just write it out manually, probably. Um, so it doesn't look great. This, this is why composability suffers. We've got to get the result out. Then we've got to test it separately. Um, we've got all the error handling mixed in with the, uh, uh, the main logic. Um, so the next step is a few lines down and nested, and the final step is nested further. So yes, it's not, not particularly nice. These are why those, we were getting those low scores. What can we do about that? So here's, here's one possibility. Um, if you saw my... Um, Functional C++ for fun and profit talk. This will look familiar because they did something very similar with optional there, doing it with expected here. Um, there's other ways to write this and there's some slight refinements. I'm taking some shortcuts, but you should get the idea. Um, this is helper code. So a lot of boilerplate, but you only do it once. Um, so I've got a function called with. I'm only calling it that to just hide what we might normally call it. Um, and before I explain that, just to explain the, um, the bits at the top, this is really just a couple of meta functions to uh, make sure that whatever type you give it, you always get an expected of something. So if it's already an expected, you get that. Otherwise, you get an expected of that and an error type. Um, and then just a uh, uh, template alias to uh, um, make that easier to work with. OK. So with takes an expected of T and E. Um, and a lambda. Again, I'm taking some shortcuts. There's nothing here to enforce that, but um, just have to accept it. So it takes a lambda, and it returns 
a type that's based on calling the lambda, so the Jekyll type <laughs> of calling the lambda, and we're going to do the add expected bit. If anyone knows where I'm going with this, you know that I'm cheating a bit here and it's the limitation, but let's brush that under the carpet for now. <laughs> so it's always going to return an expected of something based on what this lambda does. The implementation then is trivial. It's basically what we were, that, that pattern that, that we saw that we want to capture, that's what we're capturing. We're just checking <coughs> with the manual if, whether the expected has a value. If it does, we call the lambda with the dereferenced value and return, um, return that. So if the lambda returns an expected, we get that. And if not, it's wrap, wrapping it. And if not, we'll just rewrap the, the error type. We have to rewrap it because it may be, there may be a different T. Um, but we're only interested in the error channel here. So um, it took a lot, lot while to explain that, but it's actually pretty straightforward. OK. Yeah. Sorry, could you say again? Oh, right. Okay. So I think the question was um, here, the um, make unexpected bit. We're not adding an extra layer right. of errors. No, because we are, we're getting the error out there and we're passing only the error into the, the, the error type into a new expected. So we're only getting a single level of expected. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so with that, we can, we can do this, which is, you might not think it's an improvement. Um, and it's, it's not much of an improvement because now we've got to think of things inside out. So we actually, we, we start right in the middle, the highlighted bit, so a quarter two in, um, followed by the lambda that we want called if that succeeds or if that has a value. But at least now we're not dealing with having to dereference things ourselves. We get the dereference value back uh, into the lambda. And then we use that to call on to the next function, divide, and return that. So that gets caught by the outer with, which if it has a value, we'll forward on to the final lambda. Again, dereferenced, so it's, it's safer. And finally returns a, a result that's going to get wrapped up in an expected again, because if at any point one of these returns empty uh, or an error type, that's what we get back in result. Otherwise, we get the final value. So yeah, it doesn't look great, but it is slightly better. Oh, there we go. But if we change our with to operator pipe, because that's an infix function, we can write it slightly differently. And I think this is a lot better. Certainly in terms of the flow of data going through, this looks much more uh, linear, almost imperative. Um, our to int is definitely first. That's not really that great, is it? Um, if, if that returns a value, it feeds it into the next lambda. If that returns a value, it feeds it into the next lambda. Otherwise, the whole thing gets short-circuited or effectively short-circuited. Um, and we get our result. But I think that's a lot easier to read, easier to reason about. So let's, um, let's score that up. Again, relative to what we had before, safety is up because we don't have to dereference things ourselves. We're not open to that now. Um, noise, still not great, but it's better. Um, but we've still got all the, the lambda syntax there. We, we didn't really want, so not perfect. But we do have sort of separate paths. It's not a perfect score, but all of the code up here is not really dealing with the errors at all. So only when we get down to the end, we deal with the final result. So that's not bad. And composability, it's pretty much a perfect score because uh, we, we are com that's literally what we're doing here. We're composing the errors. Uh, yeah, Tony. Very good at composability. Are you prepared to recompose and return different expected error sets? <laughs> Sorry, didn't quite catch that. Are you there to use as you know, some sort of enum for error codes and the other will be used as a string to do for error codes? Because right now it seems like you're expecting the error code type to be expected to be returned to. I didn't catch everything you said, but I think you were talking about. What happens if the error type is different? Yeah. Um, how do you compose that? Um, that's a very good point. I should probably reflect that here. This is assuming that they are the same. Um, that assumption didn't hold in the, um, in the template. 
you can use any error type. But yeah, interoperability of different error types is definitely a problem. Maybe there's some ways we could do that, but um, when, I've, when I've done this sort of thing, I've, I've just standardized on, on an error type. Um, but yeah, good point. Okay, so maybe not a perfect score for composability. Make some assumptions, uh, that, that's probably better. So I mean, it's going in the right direction though. I think we agree, numbers are going up, but there's still some work to be done. Um, no, this is definitely not a new idea. Uh, in fact, this is pretty much how most functional programming languages uh, deal with errors and, and other things. Um, not strictly speaking, but this is close to uh, making standard expected a monad. Um, and actually, I've conflated two things with, with that, uh, those meta functions that really shouldn't be conflated, but um, you, you, can, you can achieve the same thing without. In fact, a slightly alternative way of doing it was presented by um, Simon Brand in a recent blog post of his, um, functional exceptionalist error handling with optional and expected. Um, his idea was to just extend optional and expected with extra methods that do what my operator was doing. So rather than having to rely on a uh, an infix operator, we call the methods. And that's another way of being able to compose things nicely. So in his case, um, we've got and then and map. Um, my, my template was doing both of those. That's why I say it's conflating two things. Um, so that's, that's probably a nicer way to do it, but that obviously doesn't work with what we've got in the standard. You'd have to rely on your own extensions. But that's, that's pretty good. So a lot of people are doing this, even in C++. Uh, it definitely works. Um, what could we do if we could change <coughs> the language a bit to make this even easier? So let's have a look at what Haskell um, does to make this easier, and other languages, but Haskell's particularly famous for this. It has something called do notation, um, because you, you deal with uh, monads a lot in Haskell. So rather than doing all of that uh, mapping and binding yourself, it gives you this uh, syntactic sugar. And if you can see there the, uh, the semicolons, these are what you'll often hear called programmable semicolons. Uh, yeah, Michael. Uh, have you talked with Taylor at all about this? Um, I haven't. So there's a paper in the next mailing. Ah, OK. Well, then I, I think I know where you're going. So the, the question was, have I spoken to Chandler? Because there's a um, paper in the next mailing. If it's a paper I'm thinking of, we'll get to that. So OK. <coughs> so uh, Haskell's do notation. The, these semicolons, they're not like semicolons in C++. This is the thing that will, when transformed by the compiler, um, will actually get transformed into doing all of that binding and, and the lambda syntax. So although this looks very imperative, it's just sequencing effectively lambdas and doing the effective my, my operator in between. Uh, in fact, you can see that uh, instead of uh, the pipe operator, Haskell uses the uh, greater than equals. That's actually a, a bind rather than a map, so slightly different, but achieves the same, same sort of result. So it's sort of like these, these rewriting rules. What if we could do something like that in C++? How would it improve things? So this is where we, what we had. Let's change that to, and I'm going to use do for now. Let's just a moment postpone the problem with the existing do keyword. Uh, just to take, take this a step at a time. So our semicolons are now, and I've highlighted one of those wrongly, um, our programmable semicolons. So this is doing our operator magic. So this is going to rewrite to basically what we saw before. But it looks a bit nicer now. In fact, not, a lot nicer, I think. But we're not quite there yet. Um, <clears throat> first of all, the semicolons. We need semicolons in C++. They, they mean something else. So instead of that, let's put a keyword in. Uh, we'll go with try, because there's a bit of precedence for that. But this is try as a keyword. There is actually a, a standalone proposal uh, from uh, Noel Douglas for uh, a try keyword somewhat similar to this. Um, so now our semicolons just mean C++ semicolons. Um, now the happy path, actually going back a bit, we still got a bit of the happy path at the end there. Uh, Matt, yeah. You highlighted the semicolon after D times two. Uh, yeah, the reason, that? so the question was, I highlighted the semicolon after D times two because when I was doing it the Haskell way, semicolons meant the Haskell was semicolons. Um, but to make it more C++-y, we put the semicolons back in. Oh, so that's a regular C++. 
that's a regular semicolon, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, so we want to move this, the happy path up. We, we want to um, make it a bit easier to deal with the error path as well. So we move the happy path in and then we'll have a lambda that you can pass to a function on whatever thing we're returning. We'll call it catch. Um, so that lambda takes some error type. Let, let's move to something we'll call standard error for now. I'll leave it unexplained exactly what that is, but it's something that contains our error object. So that's actually looking uh, a bit more natural. Yeah, Jason. Is this hypothetical or are people actually shooting things? You're getting ahead of me. Let's uh, suspend disbelief just for now. <laughs> right, we just want to see where this line of reasoning goes and then, then we'll talk about what's actually happening. Okay, so, um, so this is starting to look a bit more like something we might be familiar with, a bit more like exception handling. In fact, let's go all the way, change do to try because we couldn't use do anyway. So very much like our um, existing exception handling, but we do have that extra try keyword in there. What about the, um, uh, the, the implementation of the function that <coughs> currently is returning standard expected? Well, instead of that, let's, let's put a froze keyword in there. So that effectively tells the compiler to rewrite it to something like we just had. So instead of double, it's gonna rewrite it to Something like standard expected of double and a, an error type. Standard error this time. Okay, we're, we're returning an ex, uh, unexpected. Let's, um, let's throw instead. Again, it's just a mechanical rewrite to what we had before. Um, now, what I've done here, uh, constructed standard error with that string, that's not actually what you do. There is a standard error uh, proposal. Doesn't look quite like that, but getting ahead of ourselves. Um, so again, it's looking more like exceptions that we have, but we've been able to trace this back to something um, monadically dealing with standard expected. It's interesting. So let's, let's finish the job. Make our function that calls a lambda a, another keyword. Again, we'll reuse catch because why not? Um, so there's actually very little difference here now with current exceptions. We have the froze keyword, that's new. We have the try keyword, that's new. And actually, this now makes it marked, marked propagation, so we saw that as a problem before. Um, because we have to have both froze and try, the compiler can now check all of this at compile time. So none of this, you know, runtime checking whether an exception should be thrown or not. Um, the froze, throw and try all work together, okay? but. If you're thinking, yeah, but checked exceptions never worked out. Well, that's because first of all, they were uh, dynamic, dynamically checked, um, and they involved uh, different error types, which just made the interfaces very um, clumsy to, to work with. Uh, none of those problems that made checked exceptions uh, a problem exist here. This just gives us a means to, to actually check at compile time that all these things compose, which we don't have with current exceptions. Um, the, the error types, because we can trace this back to what it would look like with standard expected, we can see these are all static values, uh, and that, unless you actually want to allocate something in there, um, this is all happening on the stack. No allocations, no RTTI, um, all very, very lightweight. So if we had something like this, what would it score? Pretty good. Matt? Sorry, a quick question about um is it the case that it would only return, is these sort of like the hidden type here, the, uh, the uh, expected, is it double comma stood error, and is that statically known, or is it inspecting to see what things are going to be thrown? So the question is, what is the um, it, when the froze rewrites to something like return standard expected, um, is it just going to be double comma some fixed error type? Is that, <coughs> is that fair? Um, so you can, as, as written here, you have to have some default error type. Um, but possibly you could extend this with the ability to say froze E, uh, and then it will be standard expected of double or E. Um, so yeah, you could do it either way. But yeah, it is just still a mechanical translation between the two. Um, <coughs> that's fair. An extension on this, seeing as how only the first line appears in a header file, Rose doesn't actually specify that static type 
uh, are is this planning to like type erase the exception type? Okay, or so good question. So or you give it explicitly? That never works out. Um, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. You're saying if I don't if the signature only appears know the, the error type in advance because right. here you can detect it from the body, right? Okay, so um, this sort of relates to Matt's question. Yes, the, uh, and my point to Matt applies equally, that by default, well, we haven't specified what it throws, uh, there's, there's some default error type. Let's call it standard error. That's what we were looking at before. Um, but you can potentially, um, and you don't have to do it this way, but you can potentially say throws some other type. That will then be part of the signature. So either way, it's statically known. Does that answer your question? Yeah. If, if you wanted to throw a standard string, you would say throws parentheses standard oh, so, string. So if you don't say it just means standard error, it doesn't yeah. mean anything. Um, it just means standard error. Yeah, yeah. standard yeah. error is a concrete type. Ah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so the scores are pretty good. Nines and tens across the board. Um, even better than the standard expected route because there are, there are some problems with standard expected and optional that get in the way of, of some compiler optimizations that now the compiler is free to, to work around, particularly to do with um, sort of copy elision and uh, moves, um, because now we can actually separate the, the error channel from the happy path channel. Although we do think about it as a transformation back to the ADT-based error handling, it doesn't have to be implemented exactly like that. And in fact, standard error has been defined in such a way that uh, it can always fit in a register. So the error channel um, fits in a register. The fact that it is an error fits in an unused bit in, in one of the return registers. So the overhead is actually lower, therefore a higher score, than ADT-based. Um, obviously, safety is way up because of the compiler checking. It's all marked propagation checked at compile time. Noise is way down. Um, Still some room for improvement, but may maybe we don't want to go higher. Uh, I think having those try keywords in there is an improvement over not having them. Everything else, perfect 10. At least, that's my figures. <laughs> now, one of the questions that's being asked is, is this actually you know, just hypothetical? Or is this just something I dreamed up? Um, and the answer is yes and no. And the interesting thing is, when I first proposed this talk, I was going to work up to almost exactly this slide. I wasn't aware at the time there was a proposal to do exactly this in the works. So this is the proposal. It's pre-proposal at the moment. You see Herb Sutter's name on there. Not a lightweight proposal, but this has the input of um, many members of the SG14 group, but particularly Noel Douglas, who's been working on boost outcome, standard expected. Um, a lot of people that really know their stuff have uh, contributed to this. You'll actually see my name in there as well, but uh, I didn't actually contribute to this document very much. Um, and it's very interesting that few of us have all been converging on almost exactly the same idea. I think that is very reassuring that this is going to go somewhere. Yeah. Right. As Niall pointed out in his paper from this fall, it also looks a heck of a lot like script. Uh, and that was exactly where I was coming <laughs> from. Because I, I've, in fact, I have done a talk uh, only a couple of months ago at a Swift conference, well, an iOS conference, um, with the same title of this, <laughs> um, with the same sort of progression through uh, Swift types, but arriving at Swift error handling, because it looks very, very similar. And there's a reason for that, because um, a lot of the people working on Swift will come from a C++ background. They've seen all the same problems as us. They're trying to do it better. Um, and, you know, that stuff can feed back to us as well. But not just Swift. There are other languages that have very similar things. Um, most of them are, are referenced in, in this document. The other one that's referenced many times in here is um, Midori, uh, Joe Duffy's um, C-sharp-like um, compiled language. Um, all of these references, by the way, all these proposals, everything's going to be in a, there'll be a single link at the end to, to a document with all the links. So don't worry about trying to grab this. That's not actually available at that link yet. That's a, like a forward-thinking um, link shortener. <laughs> that will go to the actual proposal when it's out, but that's the proposal number. Um, 
this should be in the mailing. This is the one you were talking about. Um, yeah, was so, it? So the letter is actually talking about a different one. Okay. Um, it, it allows you to implement uh, something very similar um, in the language. So, so it's actually a much lower level facility that allows you to do this in a library. Okay, interesting. So the point from uh, Michael was that he was actually thinking of a different proposal that allows you to do something similar, but in the library, in a library. Uh, that's interesting. There's also a couple of supporting proposals from Nile. Um, I don't have the links here, but uh, for standard error and for, um, what was the other one? Um, there's an attribute you need to show that the error type is um, trivially re relocatable to make this all, um, well, it says zero overhead. Actually, the promise is potentially less than zero compared to ADT return types. Um, and, and that's part of the magic that makes that happen. So I'm really enthusiastic about this proposal. Um, when it's out, it should be in the next few days or a week or so, I think it should be at that link. Do encourage you to check it out. Um, and it's gonna be discussed in uh, Rappersville next month. So that's pretty much the end. That's the link I was telling you about. So on my website, levelofindirection.com slash refs slash cpp-optional.html. All of the other links uh, will be available there or you can catch me on, on Twitter if you didn't catch that. Um, thank you very much. And Jason. It was kind of already asked, but is um, that proposed interface is the codomain for errors limited to uh, SD error with a string? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? So I, um, in your example, you had SD error. Um, is that the only error type you can have in the codomain? Oh, you're right. So yeah, I was <coughs> hand waving a bit at the time. So the question was, is standard error the only error type you can use with this? I was hand waving a bit because I hadn't actually revealed the proposal yet, but the, um, the proposal makes it optional at the moment, I believe, whether the throws um, actually allows you to say throws E or um, forces you to use standard error. But I think the default will definitely be standard error. But you will also be able to specify a different type. I think that we're leaning towards that. Oh, so you specify after the throws keyword? Yeah. yeah. Um, How does that compose, it? though? Sorry? How does that compose? If you, you call two functions, matches mm -hmm. between different error domains. Yeah, yeah you, you'd have to oh, deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's why it's not set in stone. Um, obviously, um, it's nice that making standard error the default type means that most people will just do that. Because standard error, although it's um, it will fit in a register, uh, it does have a slot in there that you can put a, uh, <clears throat> an exception pointer or, or some other. If you do want to do something type erased, you can still do that. Uh, you can have almost an arbitrary payload. So there's very little reason to, to want to do something else. Standard error is also um, contains something very much like um, the current uh, standard, standard error code, is it? Yeah. which um, lets you specify you know, many different uh, categories of, of errors. So you deal with error codes first, and then if you need any more information, you can actually get that in there as well. Yeah, Matt. So with a follow on from that, does the std error allow you to specify um, a dynamic message? Is that, or is that a, a being held as a const char star to something? You mentioned it fitted into a register. Yeah, uh, so that, that's sort of what I was just talking about. So standard error, if I remember rightly, uh, contains an error code, um, <coughs> either actually standard error code or something like it, um, plus some way that you can put something like a, a pointer, uh, an exception pointer, or uh, something else where you can have a, a type erased uh, portion of it. Uh, obviously then, you know, don't have the no allocations guarantee, but. The yeah. error code is two words long. Yeah. So that's iffy if it fits in the register. So the, uh, the observation was standard error code is two words long, so would that fit in a register? That's why I say something like standard error code. Niall's proposal on standard error, um, I have to admit, I've, I've only skimmed through it so far, so I didn't want to say too much about it. Um, I know that he's confident that it'll fit in a register, but I couldn't give you the details offhand. Um, but I, 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 mean, I have the, uh, the proposal, I can give you a copy. Sorry to pester you with questions all the time. No, that's, that's what we have. Um, so the catch clause there. Yeah. Uh, we're kind of used to our nice polymorphic 
uh, catches. Can you have two, even in this particular world? Um, so, I, <laughs> if I if I remember rightly, I'm a little bit vague on this. If I remember rightly, you, you catch the, the single type, but because that then has a code in it, you can then do something like a. a so then then you can do a switch, but you can do. Effectively. Yeah. With, once I catch it, I can dispatch on the dynamic. But there, there may be because there are some optional extensions to the right. proposal that um, give you some other facilities. Yeah, but, but, but the good thing with that start is you can't miss the error type. So with with a classical catch, you could yeah. have a wrong error type, and then you quickly miss your exception. Yeah. So don't, don't get me wrong. I love this. Yeah. I'm just trying to poke holes in it. The, then the comments over here was that this, this means you can't miss the error type. And remember, this transforms back to the ABT based handling where you, you, know, you return the error type, you have to deal with it. Uh, same thing, but you can have finer grained uh, error reporting within that. So, question at the back? So, so, I guess there is no answer for how to propagate those two functions that does, does not work. So, the question was is there any way of propagating this through functions that don't have throws? Um, yeah. So, again, this gets into the possibly optional part uh, that I don't think is fully formed, but um, definitely the intention to be able to interoperate these with dynamic exceptions. So, <laughs> we're mostly referring to these as static exceptions. But yeah, if. So, 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 the solution would be to just, just throw the error at the dynamic exception. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, if you go through a non throws function, it becomes a dynamic exception, vice versa. If a dynamic exception comes through here, it gets converted to one of these, and that's where that exception will get put as an exception pointer into the payload of the standard error. So it's not nice to think about that because potentially you can go backwards or forwards, and that's not great. Um, but there's not really another reasonable way to do it, I think. Uh, there has been a little bit of pushback on that, but I think that's the way we're going. Um, let's have you first. Uh, what happens if standard CL? Both, or something else in their throws. Um, because here we're dealing with um, uh, static exceptions, I don't believe at this point you have the problem of something throwing during stack unwind. Um, I could be wrong there, but I, I believe that's the case. The but it that would that then be converted to. A, so obviously, in, in the. Um, so dude, just to repeat the question, so you're saying what if what is something like a standard CR or standard C out throws? Um, the block of code at the bottom, I haven't put the context of that. We don't know whether that's a function that can throw or not. Um, if it's a function marked with throws, it's going to get converted back to a dynamic exception, a uh, static exception. And if it's not, it's going to propagate as a dynamic <coughs> exception. But I don't think you had the problem of um, exceptions within a stack unwind because we're not in a stack unwinding situation here. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, back to the back. Okay, so so I'm trying to talk, trying to ask questions about the proposal. Uh, can I just omit the try catch block? Can you what? Sorry. Per the proposal, can I just omit the try catch? Ah, okay, yeah. Question was, can you omit the try catch block? Yeah. Because you could do something like that with the ADT form, and I can't remember if that was finally decided or not. It's definitely something that was discussed. Um, I believe the preference was to require the try catch block, but I know some people said they would like they would like it to be converted to a dynamic exception. The noise goes down, um, noise goes down and the evolution working group acceptance score goes down. Right. Um, so yeah, so your point was that the noise score goes down in that case. Yeah. I'm not sure I agree, but also I'm not 100% sure what the final proposal the, says. The, we need to the, check that. The point is that with exceptions, uh, you can have multiple levels of functions where you don't care about errors at all. Yeah. They just automatically propagate all the way up to, to the final try catch that you have. If, so, this, if this mechanism doesn't have that, the acceptance level at the committee level is going to go down. I mean, you know that you can do the try before the open brace of the function, right? <laughs> yes, I don't. No, sometimes, sometimes yeah. you are going to have functions where you don't want to have a try catch. Yeah, yeah and if because you, you, yeah. you, you don't care about error handling at Agreed. that level at all. Agreed. You, you can live with the try operator there, yeah. right? Yeah. You, you can yeah. live with that. But having a try catch just to rethrow the exception again 
Which does suck. Agreed, yes. Yeah. Agreed. At least in the previous version of the paper, yeah, uh, uh, automatic propagation, if you don't catch it, was a thing. Okay, so to summarize all of this, um, <laughs> There seems to be a strong preference for being able to emit the try catch and have that automatically propagate. And when you, when you mention that case, that does remind me. I know that was discussed, and I think I think we were saying it would automatically propagate. I think that's what you were picking up on, Odin, because um, it's a few weeks ago that I read the paper, and I haven't fully read the the new version yet. So um, I know Herb's going to be watching this. So uh, sorry for slaughtering that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I, yeah, now now I can't think of it. I'm fairly sure that's the case, but. We'll have to double check just to be sure, but it sounds like Odin remembers that. So, okay. Um, now, I haven't covered everything here. It's actually quite a long paper. You should definitely read it. But um, any more questions? Yeah, Tony. Uh, uh, two questions. Um, first one, where's the competition between the two um, expected returning function calls that you implemented? So, is that part of these the network calls? Or? So, I didn't catch all of that. Um, Where is the overloaded semicolon? Yeah. Right, so remember I said that we, we basically moved that into the try keyword. So the responsibility of the try keyword is to... Does that Sorry? Is that a language component? Oh, yeah, that, that's the language feature. So the compiler sees that and says, right, what we're doing here is rather than just taking whatever the function returns, we're going to assume it returns this wrapped thing, unwrap it, do the, the, the propagation of the error, otherwise use the result, oh, pass, it, if, pass it on. If the behavior of try is not customizable for, for custom types, the, the MOG one will just go down again. Sorry, the you about custom. overload the try yes. operator? No. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. I, want, I want to get my own expected thing. So this is a specific implementation of monadic handling, not programmable semicolons. No, no, no. If I cannot overload try, I'll, I will overload code away. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> I, I will. If, if you don't give me the ability here, I will do the other thing, which is wrong. We all agree. I should say, by the way, that, that separately there are uh, proposals for um, just general monads, which aren't quite there yet, but um, I would place your bets more on that for generic monadic handling. This is specific to Terra handling. I, I know that Piper that Michael was was uh, mentioning is is the more general thing. Right. Yeah, I, I want oh, to that's see one. A okay. Where those two clash. Yeah. <laughs> it will happen in the evolution. Yeah. Um, in uh, in Noel Douglas's talk that I referenced earlier, uh, he did uh, touch on the the monadic um, functions and showed how you could use those with uh, uh, standard expected. It looks much like my first version of with before I did the, the lambdas. Um, now, I believe that that's evolving in the direction of being able to provide something like the, the pipe operator, but I don't think we've got there yet. So um, hopefully that will become usable at some point, but um, not, not quite yet. OK, any other questions? Yeah. How does this compose with Constexpra? How does this compose with Constexpra? Um, Sorry? If you want the divide method to still be context, as far as I know, if you could write the ADT version with Contextpra, this should work. I don't remember if that's specifically called out in the paper. Does anyone else who's read well, it? Well, the no. question would be, I mean, uh, uh, throwing a, uh, an error in a context function translates into a fancy <laughs> compiler error at compile time if you throw a compile time. Uh, how would that for an exception, but, yeah. but here we're not actually, because the problem there is you know, the dynamic nature and the, the allocation and the RTTI, we don't have any of that here, we're just dealing with, with static uh, values, statically defined values. So there's no reason they shouldn't <coughs> compose that way. But I don't know if that's been explicitly So you, you out. cannot currently do the ADT version with Constexper because it requires placement new, but this is like a compiler, that, that, that's like a mm. stupid reason why not. Because of the implementation uh, of standard expected. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so I see no reason why you couldn't do this. Yeah. With so I, I guess I could phrase it better. Um, you cannot static assert in a context per function because you don't know if it's going to be a compile time or a runtime uh, uh, operation that's going to reach the static assert. 
so the convention is if you want to uh, emit an error with custom error message at compile time uh, within a context or function you throw, but uh, I guess you could still like translate it back. Yeah. Okay. It, it's, Never mind. You could try. You could throw and catch in this way in context for context, and use this for general purpose control flow in context for context. No problem, because you know everything that. Well, that would give us. Yeah. Okay. Mm. That enhanced it in this way. Yeah. Yeah. It's really functional. Yeah. 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 It's, this is beautiful. With yeah. So I think the summary there is we we probably can, yeah. or at least we can't think of any reason why not. Which is good. Yeah, I say, if you've just mentally translated it back to ADTs, sans the problems with placement you instead of expected, then that generally informs how you might think about these things. Since this is a language feature, uh, I don't think the placement new is a problem. Because exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. a stupid yeah. reason the, why. The compiler, the compiler can <laughs> branch on whether yeah. it does. So. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. We all agree. And given, and given, and given the uh, uh, proposal uh, for, from David, uh, to have a way to detect context for evaluation, which we are going to need anyway, uh, that's not a problem. So, yeah. I was very careful to say throw out wherever I could, it would be something like standard expected. Yeah. Um, do you sort of think about it that way, but we can improve on it, definitely. So to sort of tweak the question and confirm my understanding of this, can we mark this function const expert and use it in a context for context with no problems? Maybe not in this paper. <coughs> I'm sure Jason will write one. <laughs> maybe, maybe not in the first revision of the paper. We yeah. don't know because we just haven't heard the paper. But uh, when, when this reaches evolution and evolution likes it, it's going to say, allow us to put context. Yeah. Mm. Um, one thing that might be worth noting, although I'm definitely not qualified to reason about this myself, you put a, a nine in the happy path score as, a, uh, as in it's oh, yeah. slightly less efficient than uh, dynamic exceptions. Um, although there are more instruction cycles, there are people that are very optimistic about uh, how an out of order executing uh, processor could uh, like not ever actually cause a delay there because Setting a status uh, flag in the core definitely doesn't rely on cache or anything, so there's definitely going to be a time when it can actually do that without delaying anything, unless you're absolutely crazy and you're not memory bound, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the observation was that the, the nine here may not accurate, accurately reflect the difference in the happy path between this and dynamic exceptions, um, but I think that's only in some cases, isn't it? Not, um, not across the board. I, I don't really know enough yeah. to spec it, but there are some people that, that think it will be zero uh, overhead. Or if that, you can turn it up to 11. Yeah. Turn it up to 11? <laughs> um, yeah, well, like, like I say, compared to the alternatives, this may actually be zero, um, less than zero overhead. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that's still yet to be determined. This is just proposal. There's no implementation yet. Um, so we'll have to wait and see on that. I mean, one comment that people have here is what happens if I want to do something where I don't want it to exit in the try block? So one thing that I could think of is if you could have some kind of wrapper that actually puts it into an expected type. That basically where the exception is whatever the, the thing normally throws. And uh, so that kind of escapes that thing so that you can get the so value. I think your question is, um, is there a way of rather than what we're doing the try here, Rather than it propagating out to the to the catch, actually deal with it as if it's a standard expected or something like that. Um, and I think that's one of the optional extensions to the proposal, or or something that's being going to be considered later. It's definitely on the table. I don't think it's in the, yeah, the current if, main. If part. the value actually returned from the function is an actual value that has an actual type, uh, there should be no problem just using it without saying try in front of it. Mm. Mm. The other thing, by the way, which uh, I hadn't really brought out and it's more outside of my um, uh, range of experience, but apparently this has been talked about as being compatible with C as well. Because um, if you think about it, you, you could have something that, like standard expected, but would work with C, obviously not exactly the same. Um, and yeah, I think it's a case of yeah, uh, calling convention. APIs, I think yeah, you need a different API, yeah. either across the board or a specific uh, calling convention. But that's definitely being actively talked about, and a lot of 
people in the C community are quite excited about that, which is unusual. We're talking about internet. <laughs> While they can get rid of error note, which is the, well, the, yeah. the carrot on the stick, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. Well, it's more about interoperating with, with C++. Um, I can totally see so. them adopting this, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Because it doesn't conflict. I have another comment. Um, can we call this weird try block a Yoda block? <laughs> Earlier, um, I did have a, a slide with Yoda on. I did that because I was going to make that joke. When I, when I changed from do to try, but I missed the opportunity. Because it is very different from the other try block. Mm. Yeah. It should well, be no yeah. Yoda block because Yoda recommends not to try. Yes, but, <laughs> but then he has proven wrong. So no yeah. Yoda. Well, because Yoda is a Haskell programmer, so he would use do. Do, do not. There is no try. <laughs> oh, yeah, Jason. What well, is yeah, the uh, generic code? So, like, uh, one of the things I don't like about catch is you can't just catch anything. Like, you can use dot, 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 and you lose information. If I'm hacking, you lose get the information back. But also with try, like, is there a way to do, like, a variadic to try in this try block? Is that something I thought about, or...? Is there a way to do a variadic try? Well, because yeah. um, obviously the um, if we allow throws to specify different error types, then each of these lines might actually yield a different error. And I can't remember what the proposal says about that. And that may be one of the reasons that there's a preference to, to not let you specify it. But um, um, yeah, that may have to be accounted for there. Uh, I think that the timer is... Yeah. Broken here, so I'm not oh, sure if I'm out of time or not. Is that still? No, we're, out time. we're out of time. Okay, so I thought we'll finish here, but obviously we can carry on discussing. After. Thank you.